If we look at the modern Middle East, there really is a massive amount of complexity. And it's useful to go back several thousand years just to get a sense of what's happened, because we can look even in the Old Testament uh, at Israel and the Philistines that essentially make up a portion of what is modern-day Gaza. And so there's long been antagonism. And if we follow through the centuries, moving up to the Ottoman Empire that was very, very powerful four and 500 years ago, but became the dying man of Europe and losing in World War I, lost its territory that expanded into that Holy Land area, coupled with significant Jewish immigration into the area and the British mandate for Palestine, there were several plans to divide the area into a Jewish and Arab state, because the big question really is still, who gets to preside over the land? The 1937 Peel Commission and the 1947 UN Partition Plan gave options for these Jewish and Arab states, but neither one were really accepted on the Arab side. When Israel declared its independence from Independence Hall in Tel Aviv by Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion in 1948, several countries around the world very quickly recognized Israel, including the United States, but kicked off the first of several Arab-Israeli wars, this one lasting through to 1949, wherein Israel was successful and gained significant control over a wider swath of territory even more so than the Peel Commission and the UN Partition Plan. If we fast forward through several other Arab-Israeli wars from 1956, 1967, and 1973 in particular, Israel was very successful. Many of the Arab neighbors, though, lost. And so Israel has gained very significant control over this territory. The state of Palestine is not a recognized member or member state of the United Nations. And so it is divided into two parts, the West Bank and Gaza. The West Bank tends to have much more peaceful relations because it is governed by a much more moderate government. And indeed, some 140,000 Palestinians regularly cross the border to work or interact in Israel. Gaza, however, is a very different situation wherein Hamas, the government that is also designated as a terrorist organization by many governments, especially in the West, has been in control of the Gaza Strip since 2008. And when there was an eruption of violence last weekend, notably by a very heinous invasion by Hamas across Israel's border, uh, a lot of it is to do with that backdrop. And we've seen 1,300 Israelis killed, 199 hostages, and an Israeli retaliation that we're seeing today. In recent years, we have seen conflicts between Hamas and Israel, notably in 2008, 2014, and 2021, among others. These conflicts have typically lasted for one to two weeks and generally have involved mortars and rockets fired from Gaza into Israel, a significant Israeli response, and then typically Hamas will fire back, and that ends it. This conflict, however, looks very, very different given the brazen attack across Israel's border, notably hitting at least 22 cities and villages in the very southwest of Israel and claiming the lives of over 1,300 people. Many in Israel have called it their 9-11, and if we do the math, that is a very significant portion of their roughly 9.5 million person population. And so it's unlikely that this conflict will end anytime soon because particularly there are 199 reported hostages, Israelis and others held in Gaza. And for me, it's going to be difficult to see an end to this conflict without a return or some form of resolution with those hostages. At the moment, there is a significant Israeli force moving to the border, some 360,000 reservists, and it's difficult to know what will happen because there's a siege, electricity, water, etc. has been cut off at this time. There's a planned ground invasion, but we're unsure as to what will happen exactly because Hamas is trained for situations like this. 
Additionally, we should note that Hezbollah, a different terrorist organization, has fired rockets into Israel from southern Lebanon, that is northern Israel, and there is a real threat to expand this conflict. If that happens, in all likelihood, we will see this conflict go months and potentially draw in other actors from outside of Israel and Gaza. But the history does suggest that uh, a resolution is possible. But for me, the big question is the hostages. What happens to them? And Israel's also going to want to protect its sovereignty as well. So there will have to be some level of change of government in Gaza or some larger guarantee that the Israeli government will, will accept. And I imagine a high bar on that one. If Hezbollah attacks Israel, it will significantly change this conflict. And in some ways, I've anticipated it uh, for many years because Hezbollah has frequently amassed larger and larger numbers of rockets and missiles. Every time I lecture on this subject, the number continues to grow from 90 to 100 to 120 now to 150,000 rockets and missiles. And I've openly asked my students here, why are they continuing to amass such weapons? What's their game plan? And it seems like a time like this could be a point of utilization for Hezbollah. I've been personally uh, about a mile from that border between Israel and southern Lebanon. And it's a frightening prospect because much of it is pretty hilly and Hezbollah in particular in southern Lebanon has that higher ground where they can fire into Israel fairly easily. And so it would be a very, very significant expansion of this war because it would hearken back to the 2006 Israel-Hezbollah conflict that lasted for about three weeks, and it was very difficult for an end to take place. And so putting those two together could really expand this conflict, and we could potentially see other actors, maybe even other countries, drawn in. I don't see it as likely at this time. It looks like it's going to be contained between Israel and Gaza, but a number of terrorist organizations from around the Middle East, typically without the support of their own governments, are pledging allegiance to Hamas, and so there's the potential that this could be something wider something more akin to 1967, that is the Six-Day War, or 1973, the Yom Kippur War. The central difference between Hezbollah and Hamas is location and religious identity. Hezbollah is located primarily in southern Lebanon, although they do have wings elsewhere in the world, and they're typically much more closely aligned with Iran and Shia Islam. They exist in Lebanon, which is a very, very complex country of less than 5 million people in the Middle East, featuring Christians, Druze, Sunni Muslims, Shia Muslims, but many others as well, governed in a very, very complex system known as a consociation that tries to keep the lid on violence that broke out brutally from 1975 to 1991. Hamas is Sunni Muslim and much more closely connected to the Palestinian people. And so it seems strange that they're connected to the Shia in Iran. But given Iran's disdain for Israel, it has teamed up and supported Hamas as a means of saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, a norm per se in international relations that many countries utilize. And so Hamas, despite being Sunni, does give significant support from the Shia government in Iran, and that's the significant difference. Gaza is located in the Palestinian territories and has Hamas as a government. Hezbollah is a faction within Lebanon, but it controls a wide swath of land in southern Lebanon and has some connections to governmental positions in Lebanon. If we go back to 1912 and 1913, it was a high point of globalization. There were significant and good diplomatic relations. The Concert of Europe, formed in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815, had held for basically a century. But the problem there is that there were two major blocks aligned against each other. And then in the Balkans, uh, a fuse was lit that effectively set off against itself two different major camps that thought they could win very, very easily. 
And so in the modern era, we may have a little bit of hubris because we haven't seen a world war since 1945. And yet we too have two major camps, the United States, NATO, the larger West, as well as on the other side, Russia, China, Iran, many countries still non-aligned outside of all of it. And so I do not envision a World War III that's immediately likely to happen, but there are seeds that need to be watched and there are dangerous conflicts that are pretty close to one another because if we were to draw a line from civil wars in Sudan and Ethiopia, Libya, Yemen, to the outbreak of conflict that we've seen between Gaza and Israel, Directly above that, we have Syria that's just hit its 12 and a half year anniversary of its brutal civil war, Armenia and Azerbaijan, and then into Ukraine. There are very dangerous patterns out there wherein if diplomats and world leaders do not work carefully, a spark akin to what we saw in 1914 is possible. I'm not saying it's likely but there are dangers out there that need to be navigated and cooler heads that need to prevail and act in this area if we are to avoid a wider conflagration. If we go back 50 years to 1973 and the Yom Kippur War, we have the outbreak of violence, an attack on a religious holiday, very similar to what we saw last weekend, wherein Egypt and Syria in particular attacked Israel Egypt wanted the Sinai Peninsula back. Syria wanted the Golan Heights back, territories won by Israel in the 1967 Six-Day War. And even though that was a brutal outbreak of violence, the good news there is that Egypt and Israel developed better relations, culminating in a peace agreement in 1979. Jordan did something very similar in 1994, and so Israel over time developed better relations with its Arab neighbors, particularly Egypt in its southwest and Jordan to its east. Yet still many enemies of Israel remained there. If we fast forward through time, there were several very good attempts to develop peace from the Oslo Accords to various American presidents, other world leaders, the Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert in 2008 had a very good peace deal, but it was not accepted. But then we come to 2020 and the Trump era Abraham Accords, wherein Israel had breakthrough negotiations with several other neighbors, notably the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, that both signed on to a normalization agreement connecting commercial, scientific, educational relations and opening it with Israel. Sudan signed on to it later that year, Morocco the next year. And it looked like there was an inertia with the Abraham Accords building, notably because of interest by the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who was looking to draw closer relations with Israel. And on the weekend that Hamas attacked Israel, there was an ongoing summit, and it looked reportedly like Saudi Arabia was inching closer and closer and closer to signing on to the Abraham Accords something that Iran does not want. And so we have now, with the outbreak of violence, many Sunni Muslim and Arab governments speaking out against Israel, siding with those in Gaza, yet the framework of their agreements are still in place. And so I don't expect a wider conflict to emerge, but it certainly has derailed the Abraham Accords and the progress from that. 